Hello, everyone. Welcome back for another podcast. And this time, I'd like to introduce Jamie Harris. Uh, Jamie is a former chairman of the board of Interaction Associates, based in the United States. And it's a great pleasure to have uh, Jamie with me today. So I'd like to hand over to Jamie to just briefly describe his uh, his background and career. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much for having me. And it's been a pleasure to work with you over the years. So uh, Thank I, you. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. Uh, for your listeners, a bit of background about myself. I, I was born in California. Uh, my family moved to Michigan when I was in high school. I went to Ann Arbor High School across the street from the great University of Michigan. And uh, then I spent uh, almost eight years on the East Coast, undergraduate at Yale University, studying political ec political science and economics. And uh, then I stayed there to go into law school. Um, I left law school in the middle and uh, taught high school for a year in Brockton, Massachusetts, teaching history and uh, social studies, mm -hmm. ninth and tenth graders, one of the hardest jobs of my whole life, I yeah. would say. <laughs> um, and then, well, then went back and uh, finished uh, law school. At that time in my life, I uh, I thought I wanted to be a maritime lawyer. So I came to San Francisco and joined a law firm that was doing international shipping business law. Uh, but very quickly discovered that was not the path I wanted to be on. Mm. Uh, I continued to practice law in various iterations uh, for almost 25 years in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. mostly focusing on business and real estate transactions. Um, and during that kind of time, uh, co-founded a firm with several partners that, that was my practice for 15 years. But then again, another big change, uh, joined Interaction Associates, which had been one of my clients. Mm -hmm. And uh, for now, 22, 23 years, uh, have been focusing in the field of uh, organization development, uh, as you know, Tony, uh, Interaction Associates is very much uh, focused on the, the idea and the practice of facilitative leadership, mm -hmm. uh, team development, colla uh, collaborative problem solving, uh, collaborative approaches to organizational change. Mm -hmm. And so in that capacity with Interaction Associates, uh, I've had the privilege of working with many fine companies and organizations uh, all across the country and, and in Europe, especially such as working with you at Roche mm -hmm. um, and the opportunity to not only teach uh, the practices and skills of facilitative leadership and strategic thinking, uh, but to observe many, many leaders in action on a, on right. a right. day in and day out basis. I think so it's, yeah. that's a bit about me. <laughs> I think it's uh, highly relevant to our conversation because you've uh, not only practiced uh, about the skills of leadership, you observe leaders in action as well in, in your time. Yes, and I, I'm, I'm happy to say help some of them develop mm, yes. and become better leaders, I hope. At yes. least that's, you know, that was my dedication for many years. Excellent. Well, I'd like to move into the first question. And uh, the first question is always about um, a situation where you personally have had to demonstrate leadership. So this could be early in your career, it could be later on in your career, but um, a major milestone event, perhaps it created a breakthrough for you and others, but mm -hmm. something that's significant has stuck with you. So can you think of a situation yourself that you have been in where it's been a major milestone? Yes, uh, and and actually, uh, maybe I'll go back to to the uh, law firm that I mentioned to mm -hmm. for this topic, because um, early on uh, when we formed the firm, we of course were had been more or less independent professionals and came together as a partnership, um, and all of us, you know, practicing our specialties of law mm -hmm. and uh, digging into the the, the professional work. Mm -hmm. um, but along the way, I realized two things. One, I, I didn't really love being a lawyer. And secondly, as a business, uh, our firm needed some cohesion, needed some direction. And we were all busy, you know, working diligently for our clients, but nobody was working for the business. Mm -hmm. So I felt a call in that situation uh, to step into a different kind of, of work and basically Manage myself to become the leader and general manager of the law firm. Okay. 
Um, and that took on various forms. It took on, um, you know, just the, the financials for, for starters, you know, being sure that we had a good financial record keeping and billing system. Mm -hmm. It took on risk management priorities, such as being sure that we had good systems and processes for managing timelines and case responsibilities and uh, and statutes of limitation if people came to us, all, all these uh, sub processes, you know, practicing law. Mm. Uh, it took on becoming effectively the hiring and manager and performance uh, manager. So in, in all the, the kinds of uh, leadership and management of a, of a professional practice, more and more, I took that on. Um, not because of a lack of capability in my partners, I think, as so much as just a lack of interest. I had the interest. That was going to be my question, so actually, I, whether um, others try to uh, also get involved in those areas. There's a bit of a, 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 a tassel going on between people or whether it was because there was a vacuum and you filled it. It, it was more the latter. Mm -hmm. uh, and and also that we, we had a very collegial partnership, uh, the, the level of trust and, and – uh, and friendship was, mm. was high. Mm. So uh, I think my partners were very happy, you know, that I would step in and, and be a leader. But at the same time, I think the, the, the beginnings of my deep interest in a collaborative and facilitative form of leadership were beginning to show even before I knew anything about the, the work of Interaction Associates, mm. um, because I, I did take the, the effort, you know, to inform and involve my partners and our associates in, 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 most of the significant decisions that we had to make. Right. And um, one of the high points of that was, I recall, when we had a, a partnership meeting after we'd been together for about 10 years by that time. And um, we made some very significant decisions about the long term strategy and purpose of the firm, mm -hmm. uh, the kinds of business that we would really want to focus in, the kinds of clients we would really try to uh, find, and made some decisions about. For example, how, how big did we want to get? You know, mm. many law firms just want to grow and grow and grow and grow. But we, we agreed on some some important parameters and limits mm -hmm. um, relating to the the work life balance and the, and the family interests that all the partners in the okay. firm had as well. So that was a very satisfying foray into uh, taking the leadership reins of a successful business mm -hmm. and helping to shape not only its internal processes and systems and effectiveness, but also its its future. Mm -hmm. um, so that, and as I say, that, that sort of, I, I think in some ways indicated a lot of the things that, that I have come to believe in and want to practice because subsequently when I joined Interaction Associates, that approach of, of collaboration and an engagement of key stakeholders, of course, is a core part of the, the whole idea of facilitative leadership. Right, right. Thank you. So now I'd like to move to question two, and this is where you, you have in your career at some point observed significant leadership in, in others. So it, it may have been an individual, it may have been a team, but again, a situation which created a, um, a major breakthrough and again, something that has stuck with you as something that was significant to observe. Um, and particularly if, if it supported this notion of collaborative leadership that you've talked about. Yeah. Well, I, I actually, I, a couple of things come to mind there that in, in very different situations and different people, but uh, with a, a common thread, um, when we think about facilitative leadership um, and the, the kinds of levers and, and uh, mindsets and skill sets that are associated with being effective as a facilitative leader, one of the most important, I think, is clarity around decision making process. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, facilitative leadership doesn't mean everything's consensus. Obviously, that, that's mm -hmm. not going to work. But, but having a range, a, a range of understanding of different approaches to decision making, uh, having an intellectual understanding of the factors that would go into considering in a given situation, what's the appropriate approach to mm -hmm. making a decision, mm -hmm. and also having the self-awareness to um, 
exercise some judgment and not fall into default behaviors all the time uh, as a leader might become, you know, completely autocratic just out of habit. Right. Um, out of lack of self-awareness of the impact of that behavior, for example, in their system. So if, if we if, if I think about uh, a couple of uh, observations of very successful use of understanding of the range of approaches to decision making, coupled with a self-awareness about how a person chooses mm -hmm. what approach to take in a given situation. Uh, two examples come to mind. One was a person who, with a very large company, actually a, a German company that I worked with, um, had been brought in to um, take over the, the global research and development function of the corporation. And uh, it was definitely needed to have some change there. They had not been able to produce a significant new um, product, a pharmaceutical company. They had not been able to produce a significant new uh, approval either in the us or in europe for quite some time okay and um so this person was brought in great background uh to take over both the r d functions and to try to bring about change and bring some new developments to to uh to regulatory approval into the market mm -hmm. um i i had been working there a while before she arrived but um Shortly after she did, and when I would be working with various teams um, and, and discussing decision making with, with teams, the message that came back uniformly mm -hmm. uh, when I would pose the question, well, you know, how are decisions made around here? Uh, the message was, well, since she arrived, <laughs> uh, the decision making method is whatever she says. <laughs> And uh, that was always said a little bit tongue in cheek, but you could tell it was serious as well. You know, they, they were starting to feel a lot of top down decision making. Mm -hmm. And they were starting to feel that it was very clear who was making those decisions. Right. So at a, at a very wonderful dinner meeting with this person, uh, shortly after hearing that from several teams, I, I said, uh, I asked her if she'd like to have some feedback about my observations, what I'm hearing. And mm -hmm. I said, oh, absolutely. So I, I told her this, uh, what I'd been hearing. Right. And uh, she smiled broadly mm -hmm. and she said, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, normally, she said, I would take uh, a, a much less directive approach to decision making. My normal attitude and approach would be to involve people much more than, mm -hmm. than I have been since I've been here. Mm -hmm. But she said, when I, when I came in here and assessed what was going on and tried to get to some of the root causes of the lack of productivity of this large global organization. Uh, my diagnosis was one of the major causes of lack of productivity was lack of people willing to make decisions and take accountability for the results of their decisions. Okay. Uh, there's so much political uh, activity going on, so much uh, faux uh, consensus building going on. Nobody was willing to take accountability, mm -hmm. make a decision, mm -hmm. and stick with it. Right, right. She said, "If if if I'm going to be a successful leader in this organization, I have to I have to impact this culture, and I have to to um, raise the level of accountability and willingness of people to actually make decisions and you know make tough calls and mm -hmm. stand by them." Mm -hmm. And she said, "So I've decided that the greatest impact that I can have on the culture." is to demonstrate what I think needs to be happening. Right. And uh, it, it, it really had an impact. People began to, um, decision times were shortened. Mm -hmm. There was still a sufficient amount of engagement and conversation, mm -hmm. but with following her lead, which was very self-conscious and self-aware mm -hmm. in what she had decided to do um, and modeling, the, the behavior she wanted to see rather than go around just lecture people. You know, we need more accountability. We need, yeah, yeah, she just yeah. decided to demonstrate it. Mm -hmm. uh, it. It had a huge impact and, and a lot of log jams were broken. And did you find so, that people, did you find that people started to take on more personal leadership decision-making themselves? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So they weren't, they weren't intimidated by her behavior then? Because she was, well, may, so I, I believe some initially may have felt intimidated. 
Mm. But and, and you know, and some people left. Mm. But but others saw and agreed we need this. Right. They were, after all, united in a common cause. Right. I mm. mean, this, this this is an organization that has the common cause of bringing new medications to the world mm. to uh, save lives and make lives better. Mm. And uh, those who who really felt that dedication strongly, I think, uh, began to understand the reasons why they had not been so successful mm. and the reasons they needed to change their behaviors and, and, and they moved in that direction. Right. right. Um, another one, if, if there's time for just another sure. short example of somebody a, a much different level of their, their development as a leader. Obviously, this person was a very you know, capable mm. and sophisticated leader. It was a pleasure to work with her. Um, at, the, at the other end, uh, thinking about a, a person, again, this, this theme of uh, being a technical expert in something, but moving into management leadership roles. Mm -hmm. In my coaching in the last few years, I've, I've worked with several young uh, research scientists in, in smaller biotech companies who are just moving into their first actual having to lead and manage a group roles. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them look forward to it greatly. Some of them are intimidated by it. Mm -hmm. And there was one in particular who was really struggling. Um, again, a she, but um, she said to me one time, I'm not sure I want to do this. You know, I, I, I just, I'm now working with people who have been my peers mm -hmm. and I'm their manager now. Mm -hmm. Difficult. Uh, yeah. um, it, it's really difficult and, and, and they don't, they don't accept my role uh, in, in managing them. Mm -hmm. And, and so as, as we explored this issue with her, um, we, again, we came back to this idea of decision making and how she might use the different levels of involvement of different choices about how to engage her whole team, part of the team, or sometimes make decisions on her own to begin to demonstrate the differentiation that she needed to demonstrate as a as in her role as a manager of people mm -hmm. from her role, a continuing role as a colleague and, right. and you know, co-worker with yes. people that she also managed. Yeah. So we talked about this idea of levels of involvement, decision-making and how could she, uh, when decisions came before that, that, that needed to be made impacting the group, she could articulate what decisions it was appropriate for her to seek consensus of the group mm -hmm. and really involve them more as colleagues yeah. versus decisions where she needed, either needed to delegate to an individual or seek individual from a small subset of the group or even situations where she just needed to make the call mm -hmm. and announce the decision, mm -hmm. decide and announce yes. you know, the way of using our interaction associates technology. And so we worked through all of those choices and the factors that she might consider and how she could articulate those to her group. Um, and she reported back to me later that had a huge impact, mm -hmm. not only on the group understanding mm -hmm. that now this emerging differentiation in her role, but also in her own self-confidence mm -hmm. about fulfilling her role mm -hmm. because it, it, it gave her a, a framework and a language Yep. Yep. With which to rationalize, not only rationalize for herself, but to communicate to others mm. what she was doing and why and why it was important. Mm. So I, I would say both at, at both ends or somebody first coming into a leadership role and somebody who's been a very successful leader for a, a long career. Mm. Um, the same idea of being self, one, self-aware and two, having the intellectual knowledge to be able to make reason choices and articulate yes. them yes. about decision making yes. i've seen as as a very um, successful tool if you will yeah and i think in the latter case the example of a, a structural framework to guide you and uh, to help you make those important decisions is is very relevant yes yeah Projecting into the future, um, what would you say is your take on the, the what leaders are, should be required to be able to do in the future? Yeah, 
Well, of course, so many huge social and economic changes, right, that, that we could focus on. Uh, I mean, even just recently, the, the great resignation, as it's called, uh, mm -hmm. associated with, with the COVID pandemic. Um, but apart, apart from that, I, I think that as, as I look ahead and, and think about, uh, again, both the economic and business changes that are happening and the socioeconomic changes that are, that are happening around the globe, um, I, I think the, the biggest challenges for leaders are around values mm -hmm. and a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. Um, it, particularly here in, in the United States now, we have this odd, uh, labor situation. You know, so many people left the labor market during COVID. Um, and many are coming back, but in, in new ways and places. And at the same time, layoffs are continuing. There's still more, uh, more job openings than applicants in, mm. in many industries. Mm. So, this raises in my mind for, for a leader of a, particularly of a business organization, um, what kind of, uh, culture, what kind of sense of purpose and meaning, uh, can they project? Can they help create in their organization that will be attractive, not only to uh, new people coming in, but to, to retaining the skills and talent that, that they need for the long term. Yep. Yep. Um, I've always believed that one of the probably the most important role of a leader is to be able to answer the question, why? Mm -hmm. In other words, what's the purpose fundamentally mm -hmm. of what we're doing? Of course, we're here to have a profitable business, but uh, we, we know from a lot of research, Dan Pink's great mm -hmm. book, Drive, for example, you know, what really motivates people? Mm -hmm. It's a sense of autonomy, having some control and ability to, you know, be a free agent, yep. uh, mastery, having the ability to learn and grow and become better at something. Mm -hmm. And then the third and probably most important is having a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. what, what, what is the larger purpose? What is, what is the real why for, for what we're doing? Mm -hmm. And of course, mm -hmm. in, you know, as we, we touched on the pharmaceutical industry, uh, which I, have enjoyed working in the 15, 16 years. That that seems pretty clear to most people. Mm -hmm. But in other industries, sometimes um, that motivating or potentially inspiring purpose mm -hmm. is more or less. Mm -hmm. Let's put it that way. And, and and so I think more and more the that part of leader's role to instill the inspiration of a purpose that is meaningful to people while allowing them the chance to learn, grow and develop and, and master some aspect of their work mm -hmm. and giving them the autonomy you know, that will make them think this is a place where I can have personal agency, not be a drone. Uh, those, those I think are increasingly important requirements. So these ideas about purpose, autonomy, mastery, uh, th these are attributes of a, a, of a culture, right? Of a whole system that everybody participates in. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the, the challenges for leadership to be really self-aware around that is to understand, uh, I've always believed that leaders are what I call signal generators, their speech, their behavior. Uh, everything they do is sending signals out into the system. People are looking for and, yeah. and you know, seeking those signals as a, as a subtle form of direction, uh, a subtle form of understanding of the culture in their judgments. Do, do I belong here? Do I want to commit to this? Am I yeah. fully engaged or not? Yeah. And it's not, only so, the, um, it's not only the immediate level above. It can also be they're looking for signals higher up. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this comes from the very top. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I learned the phrase in Germany, the fish rots from the head. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think that, uh, that that encapsulates a very important uh, uh, reality, you know, in, even in very large, complex organizations. Um, of course, people, the Gallup st studies over years have shown that the primary reason that somebody stays or leaves is the relationship with their immediate manager. Of yeah. course, we know yeah. that. But yeah. still, 
the impact on the of, on the overall culture and the overall sense of engagement, uh, willingness to give extra effort to mm-hmm. an organization is also so greatly influenced by all the leaders uh, right up to the very top. Yep. yep. So for, for leaders to be really aware of that and then have the self-awareness mm-hmm. and curiosity to find out what are the signals that are being received that I'm sending? Mm-hmm. And are they supportive of these wellsprings of of engagement, motivation, uh, or not? Right. 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 Uh, so I, I I think increasingly, as people uh, are living in the complex turmoil of our mm-hmm. societies and our business environment, um, the the challenges of of, of having a sense of purpose, having a sense of individual agency through this this idea of autonomy, and a sense that this is a place that I can grow, I can develop, mm-hmm. I can I can improve my own skill and knowledge of what I do. It's going to be absolutely necessary, right. uh, in, in a, you know, to have competitive advantage yep. uh, through through people. Yeah, and I think linked to this comment before about the the great resignation, people are going to be more. Yes choosy about where they choose to spend their time. Yes, exactly. Mm. And, you know, the, the increasing social turmoil mm. will be placing more and more pressure on people uh, to maybe make choices that they wouldn't have, had, uh, have in the past, mm. uh, in addition to simply their sense of, I don't have to do this job every day again. I can go do something else. You know, yep. there'll yep. be both a pull and an internal pull, mm. uh, but there will also be forces pushing people mm. uh, who who might, you know, find themselves in an environment that they really love to work in, but but have pressures that would push them out. And so mm-hmm. again, so it's a it's how do you create a balance uh, between this turmoil going on outside? Uh, the organization and a sense of place, a sense of purpose, a sense of uh, engagement in a purpose mm-hmm. uh, through effective leadership and, and effective signal sending. I do think that that's, that's the big challenge I see, for, mm-hmm. especially for uh, corporate and uh, European and, and, and American corporate culture. Jamie Harris, thank you very much for your insights. It's been great spending time with you. Much appreciated.